And whilst they applaud the instincts of Milton Friedman, in practice, he has got the most implausible proposition of all, that somehow, spontaneously, those who have got their wealth and their position and their power and their influence, by the abuse of freedom, by dodging the obligations of civilization, will on the day that they become powerful, the day they become powerful, become, in their condescension, or their sense of fairness, or Christianity, or whatever else, great providers the remainder of people. Excuse me, so excuse it me, that's, it a tra that's a travesty. How do you become a millionaire in today's world? It's by getting special privileges from government. What kind of nonsense is this? Yeah. That government is cutting down. I don't think you take enough account when you mention the 19th century of the fact that you had an infinity of possibility of geographical and material expansion. Without that opportunity, the human capacity could have got nowhere. And the refugees that took advantage of it, including possibility, possibly your own forebears, were refugees from a system in which there was no equality, in which the struggle was for securing equality. Cannot say that Hong Kong's progress has been due to resources. But it's strategically It's demonstrated unique. by the progress of Japan after the Meiji Restoration, which has very limited resources. Demonstrated by the progress of Taiwan, which has very limited resources. Oh. Natural resources are a minor element in the progress of humankind. Mm. A man in this country is not free to pursue the occupation he wishes. He is not free to enter into certain kinds of businesses without a government permit. Until recently, he was not free to take his money from Britain and send it over to America. He was free to move personally. It was not as bad as in Russia, where he cannot, as a human being, uh, emigrate. But it's only a matter of degree whether you refuse to give him permission to take his property or refuse to give him permission to take himself. <coughs> he is not free to spend his own money that he earns. It's a road to hell that's paved with good intentions, as Samuel Johnson put Professor Freedom, uh, haven't you heard of Henry Ford? Now, here is a person who, by the accumulation of his power, not only exercised that economic power, when somebody challenged it, he got them beaten up. He got their legs broken. He got them tossed in the river. Excuse that's me. That's what happens. Henry Ford was a terrible man. <laughs> right. He was a man. No, but he did a great deal of good. Henry <laughs> Ford revolutionized transportation in the okay. United States. From your point of view, he started the high wage arrangement. He was a man who put in the five dollar a day you, wage in Detroit in but order, saying the in order to attract yeah. in order to attract people from the South. Yeah. But he didn't saying, do it because he was a good man. He yeah. was a bad man. Okay. A world of freedom is a world in which some people are free to make money. Other people are free to pursue the arts. Still other people are free to go live in communes if they want to. There's nothing wrong with a society in which if, uh, if Neil Kinnock doesn't like the uh, rat race, he can go and form a commune with some of his... I would ten minutes in a commune. <laughs> <laughs> any, more, any more than you would. <laughs> I would like a world in which there were differences. We don't want people to be identical. We, but we would like differences to be moderate. We would like to eliminate some of the vast different differences of income that today disfigure the world. The crucial question is how do you go about doing it? If a government goes directly to the task of trying to reduce differences of income by taking from some and giving to others, it almost invariably ends up being counterproductive. It ends up increasing differences rather than reducing them. It ends up giving power to some people over other people. It ends up not only doing that, but destroying or reducing incentives so the end, that you end up both with a lower level of living and no reduction of those differences which you want to achieve. If we really had a world with real freedom, with real equality of opportunity, you would end up with so small a measure of distress. There unquestionably would be some distressed people. You're never going to get rid of that, that it could be handled well by private charity. But there is a problem of going from where you are now to where you would like to go. We have, unwisely in my opinion, induced very large numbers of people to become dependent on the state. We cannot in good conscience throw them out in the street. We can't cut off overnight and say, now go, and go on your own. I have always regarded the negative income tax as a transitional mechanism for getting from where we are to where we would like to be. Now there's one other point I want to make. I believe there's a big difference between relieving distress and trying to follow a policy of eliminating differences in income. There's all the difference in the world, in my opinion, between 90% of us deciding to impose taxes on ourselves to help 10% who are in trouble. And
80% imposing taxes on 10% to help another 10%. You end up with the old parable of the forgotten man, in which A and B decide to tax C in order to help D, with a good deal of the money raised from C ending up in the pockets of A and B on the way. I think where the monetarists and uh, Professor Friedman particularly are wrong is that they will the ends, as he just did, without willing the means. And the transitional period he talks to about ignores the fact that by political action and the action of those who have wealth, they will determine levels of negative income tax and other factors at a level which ensures the perpetuity of those who are dispossessed or unfortunate for the greater glory of themselves. Now, the system that I see, both in terms of the advancement of productivity, the reduction of costs, and the general advance both of political freedom and of economic emancipation, is that that starting line, at the very least, should be one of equal capability and equal access and equal opportunity. And it isn't that we should finish up, as Professor Friedman said uh, on the film, at exactly the same finishing post, but we should start off on the same level. Now, by definition, the Friedmanites would deny that because they want a system, an ideal world, which is run by gangsters and Las Vegas uh, gamblers, basically for a world of gangsters and Las Vegas gamblers, and they are the only perfect products of that monetarist system. They must, at some stage, because of their political predilections and the power that they will eventually accumulate politically as a consequence of their economic accumulation, deny the opportunity for equality and therefore reduce the possibilities of both economic advance, productive advance, innovation, inventiveness, because they become not only a monopoly of economics but a monop and finance, but a monopoly of power as well. well and he's introduced no formula that can ensure against that. Where, do, where did the gangsters come into the story? Well, the gangsters, <laughs> I mean, in <laughs> Professor Friedman's society, because of uh, the uh, either natural endowments of talent, and of course brutality is a talent in, in a perverse sense, uh, or because of the rights in, of inheritance, or because of the way in which the wealthy who have power will run society for that purpose and not levy themselves voluntarily, incidentally, Professor, uh, in order to benefit the poor. Because of all those things, the most natural triumph of that kind of society is to value the gangster because he's got an advantage in the demand and supply economy, in the market economy. Uh, he is uh, paid more. He therefore has a higher value in the strict economic term to value the gangster more than the nurse or the grave digger or the dustbin collector. And that's the perversity of that system, even though I acknowledge that it's the product of a 19th century liberal mind that would like a perfect world, but refuses to will the means of securing that end. It simply is wrong to assert that in a world of economic freedom and political freedom, you have an accumulation of monopolies. It's also wrong to assert that in that world, you have a world of gangsters ruling gangsters. If I were going to be as demagogic as Mr. Kinnock, I would ask him whether he would rather have a world run by civil servants for civil servants at the expense of the ordinary people. They're not the alternatives. Well, but let's go back, to the, let's go back, let's go back to the facts. In the 19th century, which in the United States was a period of great economic freedom, when the government played a very small role, when total expenditures of the federal government were 3% of the national income, you had the greatest outpouring of private philanthropic eleemosynary activity the world has ever seen. The same thing was true in this country. Do you realize that three quarters of the beds in your hospitals under the health service are in hospitals that were built in the 19th century by private individuals expressing their private charitable impulses? Yes, but if you look at the there. distribution no. of income, if you look at the distribution of income, the period of economic uh, freedom was a period in which the poor were getting better off, in which the differences in income between the rich and the poor was getting smaller and not larger. If you look at the present situation and you ask who are the people who, how do you make money in today's world? How do you become a millionaire in today's world? It's by getting special privileges from government. What kind of nonsense is this that government is cutting down? If I want to get rich in the United States, the easiest way to do it is to have the government give me a television channel. I will immediately be a millionaire. Two years ago, three years ago, if I wanted to get rich in Great Britain, fortunately the conservative government has eliminated this. The best way to do it was to get a permit to get foreign exchange. You had foreign exchange control. In every country in the world, if I take India, where you have tremendous differences of income, who are the rich people in India? They are the people who have special privileges from government. So government is a source of, of differences of income, 
of special privilege of monopoly. Let me take you, let me get away, if I may, for well, a moment, getting away at from the moment, this abstract much level. More than you deserve. I want to get away to a, I want to go to a very specific issue and see how you stand on it. Those of you who say you are in favor of equality, there is one program in my country and in your country, which in my opinion is the greatest scandal that exists. It's a program which imposes heavy taxes on poor people to provide large benefits to people from the middle and upper classes. That program is the financing of higher education. I think it's a disgrace and a scandal. I myself am a beneficiary of it. But I want to ask you the question, if you are really an egalitarian, then you must share with me the view that people who go to institutions of higher education should pay the whole of their own costs and not be financed by taxes on people who are not able to go to institutions of higher education. Let, let, let yes. Will you share yeah. that with yes. me? By all means, we'll have a debate about the financing of higher education, but let's make the most fundamental point of your misrepresentation of the actual history of philanthropy in this country. See, what I was taught was that philanthropists, taught by people who were the victims of philanthropists, who uh, employed them for six days of the week and then victimized for them for the other uh, day of the week that they always spent enough to keep themselves away from the guillotine but never enough to put themselves in the workhouse and actually until we had the collective financing of the health service and so much else in this society the freedoms of the overwhelming majority of the people were so cramped by their economic incarceration that they couldn't even have a political expression now I think you really got to revise your view whatever you do about your own country about the actual progress of collective advancement in this country and the fact that the talent that has been released and the waste that has been cut down the waste of talent that's been reduced as a consequence of collective financing including the higher education program is so immense as to absolutely destroy your analogy here's a, a government that uses all the vocabulary the encouragement of the small man that Milton Friedman talks about and then adopts the economic policies of the big man so negating the possibility of the small man exploiting whatever talent or resources that he's got. And democratic socialism's assertion has been of equality of opportunity, of access, of provision, and going with that, the denial of the excesses of inherited opportunity, inherited wealth, inherited privilege. Now you described that earlier as the politics of envy. It's not. Our pursuit of fairness has never been because of envy. It's been in order to reduce and preferably abolish the waste that comes from an inegalitarian, unequal society. And whilst I applaud the instincts of Milton Friedman, in practice, he has got the most implausible proposition of all, that somehow, spontaneously, those who have got their wealth and their position and their power and their influence, by the abuse of freedom, by dodging the obligations of civilization, will on the day that they become powerful, the day they become powerful, become in their condescension or their sense of fairness or Christianity or whatever else, great providers the remainder of people. Excuse me, true. excuse me, that's a, tra happen. that's a travesty in the first place. The main reason I believe in economic freedom is because I believe it's the only way to prevent the possessors of capital from having too much power. But they don't, you don't Excuse do me, if you start along your lines, your intentions may be fine, all your talk is fine, but the plain fact is that I know hardly any governmental program enacted in the name of equality which does not take from the poor to give to the middle and upper classes as in the field of education, as in every other field. Well, it's the security of the civil service that is a major objective of most of these programs. If we take the programs that you have in this country to provide assistance to the so-called poor, one of the major effects has been to create the poor, to create a class of poor, a permanent class of poor, who are deprived of the instincts and the opportunity to do something about it. I want a world in which people are free to compete in order precisely to prevent people who have power from being able to use force over other people. Well, okay. The fundamental difficulty with your approach is that it requires the use of bad means for what you regard as good objectives. Oh. I agree with you that in a society like, for example, some of the South American countries, where you have enormous inequality, it's almost impossible to have political freedom. What, the, where we disagree is that I believe that a free economy promotes equal, lesser differences, that it reduces differences, and why? Because in such a society, a person may temporarily do very, very well, but there are a hundred other people who are there to cut them down. 
It's also to the benefit of society to have property used properly and effectively. If you say to people, you are not going to be able to leave your children property, you give them an incentive to waste their property, not to save it, not to accumulate it. If you look at where capital accumulation has come from, it has come dominantly in the, in the world from the desire, from a family feeling, the Rockefeller family, accumulated great wealth. Where did they accumulate great wealth? By producing more, by making the oil industry in a much more rational, efficient, effective, productive industry. As private individuals, they used a great deal of that wealth for good purposes, setting up the Rockefeller Foundation, restoring Williamsburg, financing my own University of Chicago. But then, I take Nelson Rockefeller, and he becomes governor of the state of New York. He does vastly more harm in his political capacity than he ever could have done harm as a private individual. He imposes taxes on the people in New York to, Im to build monuments. He destroys private universities in order to build a state university of New York in his own image. What's the difference? Because the money he spends does not come from greater production. See, the great difference is that in a fr free market economy, those extra dollars you're talking about correspond to greater product. They don't come at the expense of other people. Whereas government can only get money by taking it from some to give it to others. And that's the fundamental ethical difference between a voluntary arrangement in which you and I exchange what we produce, in which your income corresponds to whatever products you've been able to achieve, and a system in which you can send a policeman to take money out of my pocket to do something that you or he thinks is desirable. So the real issue is how you try to limit government power. The real issue, I'm not an anarchist. I don't believe that you can do without government. I think government has very important functions. And I think those functions include preventing people from coercing other people. It includes the national defense. It includes trying to maintain a stable money, a function in which government has been not <coughs> notoriously unsuccessful. It includes trying to maintain a competitive environment in which, in which competition prevails. What I am saying to you is that when government goes beyond those purposes for the things you want to achieve, it ends up not achieving them. Mm. But as in the case of higher education, as in the case of industrial monopoly, almost every industrial monopoly exists only because of special privilege from government. In each of these cases, the government in the na does something in one name. The name is equality. The name is eliminating differences. The result is almost always to create positions, special positions of privilege, but rather than yeah, the if opposite. If we take those four conditions of the lay f uh, classic laissez-faire right. that you mentioned, of those, just uh, off the top of my head, this question of the national defense, that is which, uh, the factor which promotes monopoly relationships with government, more than anything else. And, uh, Not more than anything else. Well, it does. Oh, I agree uh, with it, you. It, it does. does. Very substantially promote it. Right. When you talk about the competitive environment and the role of government in pre uh, preventing bullying by one section of another, the problem is, in the, in, uh, of essence of the kind of society do you want, that those who accumulate the economic power by their excellence, by their speculation, by their ability, by their toughness, whatever else, get into that position then get into the governmental position and actually promote the unfairness of competition and promote the uh, abuse <coughs> of the majority of the people by that minority that has power. But they don't and shouldn't. But they do. Neil, Neil, Neil Kinnick.